Well, good morning, folks. We're glad to have you with us here at Southern Baptist Church for worship this morning. Hope you've had a great week. Hope you've been able to get outside and enjoy this wonderful weather that we've had. I hear it's about to change. Of course, it's fall. It always changes, right? We know that. We've lived here. We get that, so that's all right. Let me pray for you. We'll go ahead and get started this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we come together and have opportunity to worship you. We pray, Father, that everything we do, say, sing, every aspect of what takes place today exalts and glorifies you, that it points others towards the life-altering, life-transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you have so graciously provided for us. We thank you for all that you do. Bless this time and use it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chelsea? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing on this wonderful Sunday? Wonderful. All right, well, why don't we stand and we'll begin worship.
what comes my way. I have peace through the trouble. I have joy through the struggle. And now my hope's in a brighter day. South End. Hopefully your week has been a good one, and it's great to be back in God's house again. Uh, the weather is great. It's the time we, we come with between spring and fall. It's just so good to be in, in God's house. There should be uh, connection cards in the pews in front of you. If there are prayer requests that you have, please uh, feel free to, to fill those out, because they will be in prayer this week. Uh, we'll make sure to get them on the prayer list. And uh, let's go to, to the uh, Lord now in prayer. Father, we thank you for you being the one who conquered the grave. 
who came out of the grave to go ahead and save us and cared enough about us and your love for us that you wanted us to, to be there with you, so much so that you come running to us. Father, may the needs that we have be put aside to conquer, uh, to, to show that you have conquered that grave and that we're here just simply to worship you. Father, for needs that are there, I pray that your, your loving hand will be on them. Father, I pray that you be with uh, doctors tomorrow for Pastor Mike as he undergoes surgery. May you give him a comfort and bring him back to continue to go and bring the word to us. Father, touch our hearts this morning. Make us hungry for your love. Send us out to uh, spread your love to a world that needs us so much. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. How are we doing today? I hope we're doing okay. Okay, that's a good, all right, everybody's doing all right, I guess, so <laughs> whatever. You have your copy of God's Word. We'll be in Hosea 11. Believe it or not, we have just a few more messages in Hosea. Of course, then we enter into the time of the year as we enter the holidays. Believe it or not, next month is November, and I think everybody knows what holiday is in November, don't they? Yeah, the one we eat too much at, that one, you know. Uh, and then fall, and it just seems to me when we, once you have Thanksgiving, it's like Christmas is, seem, I know it's four weeks later, but it seems like it's there. You just, it just, everything just kind of comes together. And especially those of you that have children and are trying to get everything together for them for Christmas and are trying to get family gatherings. It's just a crazy, hectic time. So that time is coming soon, but it's also a time when we celebrate all that God has done for us and the great gift of salvation that he offers us in Christ Jesus. So we're going to look at Hosea 11, verses 1 through 12. If you're able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word this morning? Hosea 11, 1 through 12. All right. And the prophet writes, he says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took, him in my, took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of man, with bonds of love, and I became to them as one who fits the yoke from, lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria, he will be their king, because they refuse to return to me. The sword will whirl against their cities and will demolish their gate bars and consume them because of their counsels. So my people are bent on turning from me, though they call them to the one on high, none at all exalts him. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst and I will not come in wrath. They will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar, and his sons will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. Ephraim surrounds me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is also unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is faithful. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you... Speak to us through the prophet, and I pray today, Father, that you use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to each of us, your people today, that we might hear from you and let the Spirit guide us as we are pointed reminded of our own challenges in our relationship with you, Father. Whatever needs to change in us, Father, as we spend time in this word today, may the Spirit make it clear to us what needs to change as we seek to be faithful to you, to trust you completely, knowing that you are the only one worthy of our absolute complete and total trust. Thank you for this time. Bless it and use it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, where do, where do we go? It's just one of these, another one of these texts, and next week's text will be a little even more challenging because it's a lot about judgment in next week's test, but, text. But we see this, that there's this, this yearning in this text. In fact, that's what the title of it in my, you know, I don't know if your Bible has those little titles over sections as you're reading along. In mine, it says, God yearns over his people. And that's really a great thing. It shows us here, God desires us. There is that mindset in some of us that we think that God is up there somewhere with his lightning bolts ready to blast us whenever we fail, right? There's people that have that. I remember there are even cartoons from back in, uh, that are older, some, they're not, they're not tech, I guess they're not Looney Tunes, they're the old cartoons they used to make where they have God and God is, is, is a guy in a robe and he's got little lightning bolts that he's throwing at people when they're messing up. So we have that in our mind that that's the way God is. 
And God is just. God is righteous. God is holy. But God's desire is not to destroy us. God's desire is that we are brought back to him in repentance. And that's what we'll see in this text is he's, he's talking about his people and how his people have strayed from him. And yet how he desires is in the verses that we'll really focus on here a little later in the text, when he wants them to come back, he wants to draw them to himself. But sometimes we're stubborn. Is that fair? People are stubborn. Have you ever had somebody in a relationship that you've had with them and maybe something kind of went crossways for whatever reason and you wanted to bring them back but you're not really sure how you can restore that relationship? Has anybody ever had that happen in their life? I think most of us have had it happen in one way or another with a friend or maybe even a family member and we, we struggle with that. Well, I think what our, our creator describes here through the prophet that there are that, is that effect sometimes in our lives that we we, we, we know we should, we should surrender, we know we should follow God, but we're so stubborn, we're just going to keep doing what we do because we've always done it that way. And we're just too tired sometimes to come back. We think somehow if we just keep going the way we're going that things will work out. And that's one of the struggles that we see even in the church of Jesus Christ today is that we can get focused on the way that we approach things, the way that we approach God, the way that we worship, the, the way that we prepare ourselves for worship that really doesn't prepare us for anything, if that's fair. And as we look at the text here, I think we'll see the true heart of our Savior and our Creator, what He wants for us. Notice he even says in the second verse, he talks about, after talking about calling them out of Egypt, which is an amazing thing to think about, that God took the nation of Israel, which was no nation at all, it was just a gathering of people who had been in bondage, and He pulls them out of Egypt. And then after a, a long journey, 40 years, I know it took a while, but you know it would have only taken a few months if they had listened to God. But, of course, like, like uh, the, us, they struggle to listen to God. We, we don't do that. Aren't you glad that we just do whatever God tells us to do, right? No, we don't. And they didn't either. And because of that, they wondered. But they finally get to their place where God has set aside for them. And he set aside this land for them. And that's where they're to make their home. That's where they're to live. That's to be the, the land that they had been given. And they've been there for a while as we read the text here, as we're in Hosea, and yet they have forgotten that. Of course, the, the Jews celebrate that great deliverance every year. That's what Passover is about. It's about God's deliverance of his people from slavery, from, from the land of Egypt. It's about the, the death angel, the Passover, coming into Israel, the final plague, and bringing that, that pronouncement from the Pharaoh that, let him go, get out of here, I don't want anything to do with him. Of course, then he changes his mind. We've all seen the movie or the cartoon, either one. And we know that he changes his mind, right? And he wants to go after them. But God delivered them. God made a people that were no people into a nation. And that's what he's reminding them of here. And then he says in verse 2, the more they called them, the more they went from me, from them, and kept sacrificing the Baals. In spite of God calling out to them, they kept chasing after the Baals, these gods that were not gods at all, and burning incense to these idols. They kept you know, that's what we talked about earlier, the high places that are mentioned throughout the Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament. They kept going to these places and following after these pagan gods and goddesses and worshiping them, even though God was calling out to them, even though God had done all these things, their hearts were still not fully focused on Him. They, they would go, we love you, we want to follow you, but we're going to go here. And like an adulterous lover, as it's described, is really what the whole point of Hosea is, isn't it? An adulteress, his, his wife Gomer is one who, even after marrying him, is still caught in adultery, still doing things she's not supposed to do. And this is a, a picture of the nation of Israel, of God's people, whose heart, though they say they love God, though they want to say they want to be with God, their heart still strays and their heart still moves in a different direction and they seek after other gods. And he reminds them of that here. And then he reminds them of this, and I love this image in verses 3 and 4 as he describes his love for them. It's like and this, these, these brought back a lot of memories. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. How many of you remember, those of you that are parents, when your children first started to walk? Anybody remember that? And you remember how excited you were? Okay, no one was excited, I guess. <laughs> Maybe you knew what was coming, right? I know. It's one thing when they're just crawling around. You can kind of control the environment. You kind of know where they can be. But then when they get up and they get mobile and they start walking, and they're like, oh, my goodness, they can get into so much more stuff, Right? You know, and we all, we all remember that. And maybe we don't remember it when we were children, obviously, because that was, a, you know, we don't remember what that happened. I don't remember when I first walked. My mother used to tell me about it, what it was like, but I don't remember. 
But that's the image we have here of God was teaching them to, to walk, how to live. He was guiding them like a doting father, trying to help them understand. And even when they would struggle, he would take them in his arms. And all along, this nurturing, this caring, this healing that he's doing in their lives, they don't even realize it, that it's the Father that is their God, the one that loves them, that is carrying them through all the struggles they're facing. He is walking with them. He says in verse 4, I led them with the cords of a man, with bonds of love. I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down to feed them. Let that picture stick in your mind for a moment. And those of us who've been parents understand that often when you're going to feed your child, especially when they're small, before they learn to feed themselves, remember those, we, I don't know about you, I couldn't wait for our daughters to learn to feed themselves. It was just good. And, uh, you know, that's a good thing. But when you have to feed them, you, you have to get down on their level, right? You can't just toss it at them, right? That wouldn't work. You have to get down there and you know you usually most we got a high chair and then and and they of course high chairs probably weren't used in this era they would be literally maybe on the floor and they're getting down he's using this image of getting down and I'm, I'm literally feeding them and the tenderness and the love that he's showing in these two verses of the care that the father has for his children that he has for the people of Israel that he has for us that love that he has that that willingness you know a lot of times we look at God and we think of God as this giant robed ogre waiting to zap us when it's not the picture, a biblical picture of who God is, is it? That's a very unbiblical picture of God. That's not a scriptural picture. This, God is one who loves and cares for us. He's, he is one who desires to do what is best for us. He desires to nurture, nurture us and nurture his people. But in spite of all these things that God had done for his people, then we see in verse 5 this struggle with the people. They, they don't want to follow after him. And he says, I'm not going to send you back to Egypt again where you were. And instead, judgment's coming. And that's what he says. But Assyria, he will be their king because they refuse to return to me, because they refuse to listen, because they refuse to follow him, because they refuse to trust him. They continue to seek other gods. Because of that, judgment comes. And sin brings judgment. We know this to be true. In our own world, in our own country today, in our own county, if you break the laws, there's judgment coming, right? You may think you can drive as fast as you want, but eventually you will meet either the county, the local, or the highway patrol will find you and catch you, and you will be judged for what you've done wrong, right? That just makes sense. It eventually will happen. There is a justice in this world, and we're grateful for that justice as a whole, aren't we? We want, you know, it, what would it be like if every day was, and I know it's crazy driving out there, I get that, but what if every day was like the Indianapolis 500? I don't know if you know, you know and there was just no speed limits, and everybody did what they, what they want. I think there's a road in Germany like that called the Autobahn, right, where there's no speed limits. Also has one of the highest fatality rates in the world on the Autobahn. I mean, of course, when you're driving these insane cars that can go nearly 200 miles an hour, you know, I think there's a real, real chance someone's going to have an accident. What do you think? I mean, just, you know, it, if you notice, that's what happens when they do car races, right? They, and they just drive in circles. You think that'd be easy enough. And did they have this horrific wrecks because they're driving at such insane speeds, aren't they? I mean, think about, have you ever thought about how fast they're driving in a race car? You know, you know you've driven, you know, 75, 80 miles an hour on the interstate. That feels pretty fast. But can you imagine doubling that? Your reaction time is you don't have any time to react at a turn, and you're, you're, you know, it's just crazy. And they're doing that, and yet sometimes, as I thought of that, and I was thinking of this text, that's kind of the way that we sometimes try to live. We, if we don't have any parameters or any, any restrictions on us, we would do whatever we want. That's kind of the way, can you imagine what that would be like on your commute if there were no speed limits? Think about that for a minute. So it would probably still go really slow because there's so many people out there. Well, you may be right. You must still drive 30 miles an hour. I don't know. I don't commute like many of you do, but I think it would be a scarier place without those, those speed limits and those signs and those, those boundaries for us. And yet in our own life, we have those boundaries. Well, God has boundaries for us. He has parameters for us, not because he wants to ruin our lives, but because he's trying to guide us on the path that he has for us. And he is concerned about us and knows what's best for us. Much as parents, you have boundaries for your children, especially when they're little. You're trying to help them understand some things that they don't understand. And then they become teenagers and they forget everything you told them, right? That's a joke, okay? I was a teenager once. We all were too. And I can remember 
how when I became a teenager, especially when I was in high school, how crazy I thought my parents were, that they knew nothing about life. I believe that because that's what my friends said. And their parents were the same way. That's what we all thought. And then as I got older, especially when I got married and in my 20s, I started realizing my mom and dad are pretty smart. Did it happen to anybody else? In fact, my dad was, was a stinking genius. I mean, I, I got it. Things that he had told me that I thought were, oh, you just, that's just, you know, it's dad speak. That's what they tell you because it's kind of like a script they all get in the office. No. And I've heard myself oftentimes when I talk with my girls sounding exactly like my father saying the same things he told me. Does that happen to any other guys out there? I guess not. But it does happen to us as we seek to. And that's what the imagery here that we're getting from, from Hosea is he wants us to understand and see God as our Father, as the one who loves us, as the one who's guiding us, the one who is trying to point us towards a path that he has for us. That's what he's doing with his people here. Even when they l- refuse to listen, even when they refuse to, to come to him, and because they have chosen that path, eventually judgment must come. And in verse 6, he says, The sword will swirl against their cities and will demolish their gate bars and consume them because of their counsels. Judgment will come. And why does it come? Verse 7 tells us so well. So my people are bent on turning from me. Though they call them to the one on high, none at all exalt. So they say they're my followers, but no one will exalt me. No one will listen to me. No one will follow me. They, they just give me good lip service. They profess to be followers of God, but their lives do not reflect that they are. Everything they do shows that they really don't care what I have to say to them. And that's the struggle for God's people sometimes, isn't it? For us as individuals, because we, we know the path we want to be on. We think we know. We want to follow God. We want to do what's right. But then we like having our own way. Anybody out there besides me like having their own way? Don't lie. Yeah. We like it our way. I think there was a, a restaurant chain that had that slogan way back, and most of you are too young to remember it. I remember the commercials. Okay. You know, have it your way, right? Anybody, that ring a bell with anybody? You know what I'm talking about. That's that, and we like that. We like having things our way, the way that we want them. I'm not saying you like that restaurant, but you like, you like it your way. Whatever it is, when you go to eat somewhere, when you go to a restaurant and you pay, you have a certain way you like your food. We could probably have a debate in the, the certain way you like your steak cooked, right? If you eat steak. Anybody else eat steak or like steak? Okay. You have a certain way. You know, and they give you the choices, right? You can have it rare, medium rare, you know, medium, medium well, well done, whatever. You can have these different ways, and you decide. That's the idea. You decide how your steak is cooked because there's a certain way you like it. And that's a debate. Some people like it a certain way. My wife and I like our steak differently, and that's okay. She likes hers one way. I like mine another way. That's, that's just the way people are. We're different. And in life itself, we often struggle with this. In life itself, we, we have things going a certain way, and we want them to go a way that that fits what we believe to be best, and then God has his way. And his way is the best way always, but we don't always see it that way. And when we're following him and seeking to trust him and seeking to be what he has called us to be, well, God, how, how do we do this? And he says, this is how you do it. I want you to, to trust me to do this. I want, when, when this thing comes, I want you to do this. When this temptation comes, I want you to run from it. I want you to stay in my word. I want you to stay close to me, and I will help you follow the path that I have for you. And we're like, well, no, I, I, I want to do it my way. And that's that idea in verse 7. They are bent on turning from me. There's like, almost like it's innate in us, and that's part of our sin nature as human beings, I believe, is that we have this desire to do everything the way we want and then to reject what we know, even if we know it's better because it's our way, we think our way is always better. Have you ever been around somebody like that, that no matter what suggestion you had for them, they felt they had a better plan than the one you had for them? And, and we do that to God all the time, don't we? God has a direction for your life. He has a goal, a purpose, a plan. He knows how your life can best be used for the sake of his kingdom to accomplish the things that he has designed you to accomplish. And then there are times that we're like, well, God, that's a great idea. I'm glad you have this plan, but I think it would be better if we did it this way. Because it'll work for me. 
And the struggle that we have oftentimes in our walk with our, following our, our Savior and, and being the children of God that he's called us to become is, is comes back to that stubbornness in our will, that desire to do things and have things our way, to do things the way we want to do them. And we see this at work all around us, don't we? Do you not see that in society? How many people want things their way and they really don't care how it impacts anybody else. They want things their way. Now, I'm glad you don't see this on the roads of Maryland, right? And Virginia. People wanting their way, not caring about anyone else. That never happens around here, does it? Aren't you glad everybody's very courteous when you're going down the highway if you need in? Right? <laughs> No, not exactly, is it? And you, like I said, you know this better than me. I've had limited experience and I've seen it. And you know what? That's a universal reality everywhere, folks. Everywhere I've ever been, that's the way it is. Because that's ingrained, unfortunately, in our flawed nature. That's part of the fall. As we become very self-centered, it's part of it. Apart from Christ, we are that way. People are that way. Apart from Jesus, We will be focused on self, on what I want, what's best for me. I'm not really concerned about anyone else. It's all about me. And what God is seeking to deliver us from through Christ Jesus as we surrender to him is to help us understand it's not all about us. Instead, it's all about the king. It's all about what he has for us. It's all about his purpose, his plan, his direction. And it's about the body. It's about others as well. Helping us to see beyond ourselves, to see that there are things in us that we may think are best for us, but are they best for everybody? Because I really believe our Creator is focusing on what's best for the body. And I don't just mean that for South End, I mean for the body of Christ. That things are better that he has a purpose and a plan that's much higher than ours and a direction for your life. And the reason why that he calls us to do the things he calls us to do isn't just for us, but it's for someone else. Someone who may need that. It's why we have what we call extended session, our nursery time on Sunday mornings. Now, there are many of you that do not have small children, and you're probably grateful for that. You've done that, right? But we do have people that come that do, and so we have that service to help them. So what? So that they can participate in this with us. We do that as a body, right, to help them. That's just one example. We do the same with children's churches. There's other things that we do. Why do we have an Awana ministry in our church? Because, because why? Because we believe that sharing the Word of God and teaching the Word of God to children matters. Amen, Right? So if they can have an understanding, we give that, it's, it's, it's really a part of, 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 of discipleship. It's a part of equipping and encouraging them. It's not just something we do because we need to do something at 5.30 to 7 on Sunday nights, right? It's more than that. There's a purpose to that. There's a focus. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not about us. It's more about the body. It's about the kingdom. Because many of the people you will discover that work in that ministry do not even have children in that ministry anymore. Some do, but some don't. And so, but why, but why do they keep doing that? I believe they keep doing that because they want to invest. They want to see a difference made. They believe that if you share the word of God with children, it will make a difference in their lives, right? And I'm just using that as one example. There are many things. Why do we have Sunday school classes here on Sunday morning? Why don't we just come into church and start at 1045? We get to sleep in an hour longer, right? It'd be great. But why do we have those, those times together for that same reason, to equip to study God's word, because there's just there's one thing about hearing me, the talking head, stand up here and tell you about what the word of God says each Sunday morning, and there's something else when you're sitting in a room with a smaller group of people, and you're looking over the word together, and you're reading it, and you're looking at it, and examining it, you're studying it, and you're asking questions that you probably would love to ask me when I'm talking, but you'd feel weird asking those questions, but you can in a small group, can't you? And so you're able to dialogue and really get into the word in a way that you cannot in the worship service. And that's why we do that. It also provides a time of connection. Now, the only real time of connection that we have here, or two, really, is when you're in here and we have you greet one another, and when you leave and you can greet me or you can maybe spend a little time in the foyer. But you can have a lot more connection when you're in a smaller group in a room with some people, can't you, right? And there's a purpose to that. And so, Pastor, we know these things. I know you know these things. We all know these things. Sometimes we forget that the reason why we are here, the reason why we come together, it's not about us. 
It's about the body. I want you to just take a moment. We're going to go into the New Testament. John 15, very familiar text. We're going to look at the end of this text, not the middle of it, actually, the middle part of it, where Jesus talks to his disciples. And of course, as you know, John 15, this is the, you know, he's talking to them about, he's talked about them being the branches and he's the vine. And then he talks about in 12 through 17, he talks about their relationship with one another. And I'd encourage you to spend some time with this text later. But I love what he says here. The Savior says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all the things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. So whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you, that you love one another. I think it's, when you think about it, really pretty simple. I mean, what we're to be as a church is laid out so clearly and so well in those verses. And no, I'm not going to preach a sermon on those verses as well today. But I thought that text really speaks to what Hosea is trying to communicate here, what God is trying to say to his people, because that's really what God seeks. And notice as we kind of dive into really this next couple verses, three verses that we look at here, eight and nine, or just two verses, eight and nine, really speak to the heart of God. And I just want, to, want you to walk through them with me again, because it really tells where he is at. He's, he sees their rebellion. He sees how they follow other gods, how they reject him. He sees how they go on that path. And then he says this, he says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? And how can I treat you like Zeboam? In case you weren't aware of the town, those are two cities, Adma and Zeboam, that are mentioned in Genesis that were destroyed with Nineveh. I mean, excuse me, with Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Excuse me, I said Nineveh. Not Nineveh, I'm talking about Nineveh. I'm talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, when God sent the angel, told him to get out of the city, you know, and Lot gets out. You know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, these are two other cities that were in similar in their sin. And God says, I don't want to treat you like those cities. My heart is turned over within me, God says. All my compassions are kindled. God desires mercy. God desires to show compassion to his people. I will not execute my first anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. I'm I'm so glad God is not like me. How about you? Because I'm, I'm, I can get the way where sometimes when things aren't going the way they're supposed to and someone, you know, is doing something they're not supposed to, I want to come in wrath. That's why I like those movies, and I know you do too, some of you people do, they've talked about them, where the, where the bad guy gets it in the end, right? And the good guy gets him. We like that. It kind of fits our sense of justice, even if it's a distorted sense of justice. We like that. We like that. We may not like the way it all ends up, but we, we kind of like the bad guy getting his just desserts, right? And yet we see and hear the heart of our Savior, our Creator, towards his people is one of mercy and compassion, of drawing them to himself, of, of helping us find the air of our ways and bringing us home. Because his desire is that we come to know him. I mean, God already knows us. He knows everything about us. He knows all our good things and all the other stuff too and still loves us. And his desire for us is that we would begin to know him. And that's, a, that's an unfathomable reality. To fully know and understand God in this realm of existence is impossible. Our minds cannot handle it. Even infused with the work and spirit of God within us, we cannot fully grasp everything. There's just too much about God to know. He's too big. Too many things about him. But the day will come when we'll be able to grasp far more than we do now. Begin to understand. And that's why verse 10 is just one of those verses that brings, it's kind of a weird picture, but it brings me a lot of hope when he says they will walk after the Lord. And he will roar like a lion. And you, anybody ever heard a lion roar on TV? I, I hope not in person. I hope you haven't been in the jungle and heard one. That'd be bad because that means your dinner. So anyway, right? Now, huh? 
Or the zoo, there you go. Zoo's a good place. Yeah, seeing lions behind bars is a good. I do not want to see one in person, unrestricted. That would not be good between, because, you know, I look too much like lunch. So I don't want to do that. And, uh, but yeah, there's something about, there's something powerful, powerful about that roar. And that's what it says. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar. And because of that, indeed, his, and his sons will come trembling from the west. They will come back to him. The purpose of the roar is not to scare. The purpose of the roar is to call here in this text, to call his people back home because he loves them. He's calling them to himself. And he goes on to the rest of this text to describe it. They'll come trembling like and his plan for us. I think my mic went out, didn't it? Okay. I'm back. Oh, there we go. Just one. Don't you love electronics? Yeah, that's good. So you probably didn't hear a word I said, and I'm not going to say it again, sorry. So you don't want to do that. But that whole focus there, he says, is that idea of him calling us, and we come to him. We come trembling as he describes these different animals that come back to this whole, this whole picture of, of we will be like that. We will come knowing he is God. We will understand when the lion roars, and that being lion, and that's not literally like he's a lion. He doesn't turn into a lion. It's the sound of his voice. When God calls us, we will come. And that's the imagery we see here. This is that hope that we have. And yet there's still that rebellion he reminds us of in verse 12. You can look at that again. There's still that, that, that aspect of us that wants our own way. And yet God is seeking his people and drawing them to himself. And I am so grateful that God is one who seeks us, that God is one who calls us home, that my salvation does not depend on me thinking, well, I guess I really need God. Because if that was what it depended on, I would never go looking for God in the first place. I don't know about you. i got enough to do. But instead, he comes to me. He calls me out. He draws me to himself. He shows me his goodness and his power and his grace. And because of that, I am drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit to him. And so are you as a child of God. He draws us to himself. He calls us home. And my hope this morning as we've looked at this text is you begin to see at least a snapshot, a picture, a portion of God's love for you, how much he desires you, how much he is seeking after you, that he is a God who cares for you. He is indeed a righteous and holy God. He is able to do whatever he desires, and yet he calls us his children, and he desires to bring us home. And in some similar way, it kind of reminds me of a lot of parents that I know. And I know, I know many of you know, and I talk about it probably more than I should, but for many years I was a youth pastor. And so I spent a lot of time with, with parents and children, teenagers, and I also spent a lot of time with some parents who were struggling with their children who were not following in a way that they would want them to follow God. Their lives were not really on the right path. And they were making some really dumb decisions. And I can remember sitting in a room more than once with different parents, and we would be praying for their son or daughter, and that were, that were just, you know, well, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm at loss. I don't know. And I would love to tell you every time we pray that that child came back, and they didn't, but many times they did. But the gut-wrenching feeling of a parent whose child has chosen a path different from the one that God has for him or her Is, is really hard to describe. You just have to go through it, don't you? And yet that's very similar in, in a lot of ways. Just magnify that by about a billion and you'll get what the father, the creator, has for, you, for his children is he wants us to come home and then we choose not to. And I often wonder as I think of, as I was going through this text this week and thinking about many of the things that Hosea was talking about and especially that description of God and at the end of verse 9 where it says, and I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, that you know, we think of that in a lot in, in wrath, but really that's also a lot in mercy and in hope and in compassion. And I'm not trying to say that God is some wimpy little guy out there that just wants to be liked. That's not what I'm saying at all. If you hear that, you're not hearing me. But the heart of God towards humanity is compassion. It's mercy. I mean, why would he do... What he what allowed to happen with, with Jesus on the cross? Why would he allow that to happen if compassion was not at the heart of our Creator? Why wouldn't he just keep 
you know, doing the flood thing until he got all of them wiped out and got the right people. You know, he could do that in different ways, right? Just get rid of people. Okay, those people are messed up. Let's do it again. We'll start with a new group. But he chooses not to. He loves us too much just to let that happen. So what about you today? What about me? What is there in our lives, possibly, that is not allowing us to really grasp the depth of the love that this Creator has for us? Maybe we look at it, you know, that can't, it's too good to be true. That's just what preachers say. I don't know. But I really earnestly believe that if the church of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, if we really begin to believe and know and understand the depth of God's love for us as, as best we can, it would change us. It would radically transform us. I think it's why we're drawn to the redemption stories, isn't it? To the story of someone who's gone the wrong way and yet in their heart is turned back. Because at our core, we want that redemption from our Creator. And He has offered it to us. Because He cares for you. While He is holy and just, I'm not trying to demean that. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way. But that's also, He is holy and just. He's good. And because He's good, He's merciful. And I know that I don't deserve His mercy. But I'm grateful that He gives it to me anyway. Have you received that mercy that the Creator offers to you at some point in your life? Have you said, okay, God, I'm ready. I've done it. That's fine today. Let's, let's just do it. Or is it just something you think, well, that's for everybody else. You don't know what I've done, preacher. No, I don't, but God does. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for how you minister to us. We thank you for your word. I thank you for the words of the prophet today as he speaks to us and reminds us of your love for us, your compassion, your grace, all that you've done. And I pray, Lord God, that in some way, if there is one either here or listen to my voice that has not surrendered to you, that today would be the day that they would. Thank you for loving us, even then when we're not very lovely. Thank you for being merciful when we don't deserve it. Thank you for offering us another chance when we can't even earn it. Use this time in whatever way you desire, God. May you be exalted and glorified through it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.